This program, The Entire Bible in 90 Minutes, is copyright 2022 by Richard A. Matheson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to The Entire Bible in 90 Minutes, from Genesis to Revelation, how everything fits together. And my name is Pastor Richard Matheson, the pastor of this church. And it's November 6th. Okay, this is the Holy Bible. It is not possible to cover the entire Bible in detail in 90 minutes. But what is possible is to cover the big picture the main message of the Bible and the way everything fits together. And that's what I intend to do today. The Lord God Almighty is smarter than any human being. But the Lord is also mysterious. He has chosen to reveal himself in a particular way in the Bible. And it's like a play in three acts. Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Act 1 is the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, about ancient Israel and Judaism. And he revealed himself in that way. Act 2 was Jesus of Nazareth and his life, death, and resurrection. And finally, the triune God reveals himself as Act 3, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in the Holy Christian Church the communion of saints. This is Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. You can see all the tongues of fire there. And today's presentation is the first half it will be on the New Testament, which is Act 2 and Act 3, Jesus and the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. And then I'm going to stop for questions. And then the second half will be on the Old Testament and how everything fits together. And I will stop again for questions. So I hope some of you have questions, especially any pastors here. <laughs> well, I don't want to ask for questions in a you know, silence, but we'll see. Okay, at the center of the Bible is Jesus. There he is, okay. Okay. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the most influential person in the history of the entire world. Jesus changed the course of history of the entire world. And because of Jesus, the Bible has been the most influential book in the history of the entire world. Are these overstatements? No. These are scientifically true, fully documented, and accepted by any well-informed atheist or agnostic. Although they may say, for better or for worse, Jesus was the most influential person in the history of the world, for better or for worse. He changed the course of history, for better or for worse. The Bible is the most influential book, for better or for worse. The Bible changed the course of history, for better or for worse. Here is, the, ooh, I haven't handed out the handout, sorry. Yeah. Just give one of each to everybody. Okay, I have a timeline of civilization for Bible purposes here, and it covers the entire history of the world from, as you can see, from 3000 BC. There's 3000 BC. That's the invention of writing in uh, ancient Babylonia and ancient Egypt. And then we go uh, for 3,000 years up to zero, which is the birth of Jesus, the year zero. And then another 2,000 years to today, 2022. 5,000 years, the entire history of the uh, of civilization. And it's divided into two parts. 
the before Jesus, before Christ, and the after Jesus, Anno Domine, and, and that means before Jesus and after Jesus. Some secular people don't like it, so they call it BCE instead of, it's before the current era. And they hear the current era. So they don't get the religious, but it's still before Jesus and after Jesus. In the year 0 AD, when Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus was the emperor of those years. And the number of Christian believers before Jesus was born is how many? Zero. 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 Okay. Now, 100 years later, there's about 8,000 believers. These are scientific uh, research numbers. And we go another 200 years, it's about 150,000. Another 100 years to 380, we're up to 3 million. And that is when the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great uh, made Christian, Christianity legal because it was an illegal, persecuted religion. And then we go to 400 AD. By this time, there's 25 million Christians. And at that point, uh, this emperor, Theodosius I, in 391, had made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And that's important because it meant the Roman Empire became monotheistic rather than polytheistic. Everything before that, really in almost the whole world, had been polytheistic. And that was the point at which the Roman Empire became monotheistic. And I have a comment here from a, a very uh, highly respected biblical scholar named Mark Herman. And he says, the single greatest cultural transformation in history is the transformation of the Roman Empire from a dominance-oriented empire, I use the iron fist to symbolize that, to an empire with an ideology that urged an ethic of love and service and equality. That's from a scientist who is an atheist. So the number of Christian believers went from zero to 25 million in only 400 years. And here's world religions today, about 7.6 billion people, and of them 2 billion, 2.38 billion, or 31.1% are Christians, about 25% are Islam, uh, Hinduism about 15%, Buddhism about 5%. Now what happened in 400 AD? The Roman Empire was divided into two halves. The eastern half, which is known as the Byzantine Empire because it's based in Byzantium, although it was renamed Constantinople, and that speaks Greek. And the western half, based in Rome, which is uh, speaking Latin, and those are the two halves of the Roman Empire pretty much from then on. Christianity in the Roman Empire, the, uh, there was an enormous influence over a thousand years. Western civilization was entirely permeated by Christianity, and the Bible was recognized or regarded as literally true. You could almost call it fundamentalist for over a thousand years, and uh, that's the heritage of Western civilization. So the eastern half, that Byzantine Empire, endured for over a thousand years from 400 AD to 1453 AD until it was conquered by the Muslims. But the western half had a very difficult experience. From 400 to 1000, it was the Dark Ages. From 1000 to 1600, the High Middle Ages and the later Middle Ages. And then from 1600 to 1800, the wars of religion and the Enlightenment. So the Dark Ages were an ugly, ugly time, a period when the Western Empire was invaded by barbarians 
first the Germanic tribes, that was ugly, ugly, and the sack of Rome by the Visigoths. And during the Dark Ages, the western half of the Roman Empire disintegrated into feudalism, but the Germanic barbarians, and that includes the Ger Germanic, the Frankish in France, the Angles and Saxons in England, uh, were gradually converted to Christianity, and we even had uh, Charlemagne crowned. But there were more barbari barbarians around, a new group called a Vi of polytheistic barbarians called the Vikings. And that's my, yeah, my wife knows it. All right, all right, we got another Scandinavian uh, here. Uh, I'm full blood of Norwegian. But don't blame it on me. My wife still thinks I'm a barbarian. So. <laughs> okay, there's the, there's the Vikings. And by the end of the Dark Ages, the Vikings had been converted to Christianity. That's by about a thousand. And the High Middle Ages were much more positive, but the political structure was fragmented into competing nations, and the only unifying factor was the church in Rome. And the church was, at that time, very supportive of science. So we had the High Middle Ages, enormous progress in science and art. The founding of the great universities led to the Renaissance and Reformation. And Western civilization gave birth to two world-changing inventions, the university and modern experimental science. So here's the first 10 universities in the world. And you can see they're all in Western civilization, Italy, England, Spain, France, Portugal. Okay, they're all founded by the Christian church in Christian nations. And in the high Middle Ages, the Catholic Church built great cathedrals, Gothic architecture. The uh, high Middle Ages saw the recovery of Plato and Aristotle, including contributions from Muslim scholars and uh, good things like the Magna Carta and in political, positive political developments, and many bad things happening, wars, crusades, plagues, inquisition, a lot of ugly things as well as good things. And modern experimental science emerged within these Christian universities. Here's the big names, uh, Roger Bacon, Copernicus, uh, Galileo, Francis Bacon, major figure in uh, the origin of experimental science. And throughout the high Middle Ages and later Middle Ages, uh, the church was a supporter of science. Nearly all the scientists were Christians. They saw no conflict. The big challenge came later from social sciences. And Thomas Kuhn, a famous historian of science, said the church was supportive in this period, 1,000 to 1,600. Not before and not after, but that's another story. But then there's the Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther, and we've heard of him, in, starting in 1517. And that was a revolution. It was a religious revolution, but also a political revolution. It resulted in terrible wars between Protestants and Catholics, ugly ugly, especially since they both are claiming to love their neighbor as much as themselves and they are killing each other. But out of this, uh, it created enormous death and destruction, but it also gave a strong boost to freedom, often inadvertently, and it led to the Enlightenment era in France and Britain and Scotland and the United States. And the most important period was this age of enlightenment, usually called 1750 to 1800. And we can trace the concepts of freedom and equality. And, you know, uh, here's like the English Glorious Revolution of 16, the American uh, Revolutionary War, Virginia's Statute of Religious Freedom, American Constitution, the American Bill of Rights, the French uh, revolution and their declaration of the rights of man. This is all happening in the same place, the civilization 
of Western Europe. Put them on our timeline, you see from 3,000 out of this 5,000 years, it's really only the last 250 years that there was even any possibility of religious freedom or a possibility of secularism. And Thomas Jefferson, religious freedom, early statutes. Uh, monotheism and experimental science are thought by science historians to be closely connected because you don't do experiments if you think the world is run by a polytheist bunch of deities. Like, uh, okay, here's the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. Uh, and the four freedoms that was enunciated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but the list is good. Political freedom, economic freedom, religious freedom, and intellectual freedom. Okay, out of an enormous amount of pain and ugliness came the birth of all of our modern freedoms. So, in this entire Bible class, why am I covering all this history after the Bible was written? to demonstrate that Jesus and the Bible changed the course of human history and that God has continued to work through history. Remember, he continued to work in the Old Testament, in Jesus, and now in the communion of saints after that first Pentecost. God has continued to work and he's working right now. I do want to remind everybody when I say God is working, forget the church buildings, forget the institutional church, forget religion. God is working through individuals who are dedicated to the Lord Jesus and to the ethics and to the things that he stands for. It's always people. Now let's look at the events and writings of the New Testament. I know you want that. Here's the New Testament. Jesus of Nazareth, we can put him at about 4 B.C. to about 30 A.D. Uh, that's partly because King Herod, he was born while well, King Herod, uh, and King Herod died in 4 B.C., so that's why we say that was when Jesus was born, because it couldn't be zero. And here is what happened. We had, after uh, his death, we'll get to that, Paul's letters are written from about 49 to 62, the Gospel of Mark between 65 and 70, the Gospel of Matthew and Luke between 80 and 85, and the Gospel of John between 90 and 95. So even the earliest one, Mark, if Jesus died about 30, that's 35 to 40 years later. But the first to be written were those letters of Paul. So we have, uh, these are the main books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and the letters of Paul, all written by 100 AD. And then we had other books, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation, written by 300 at least. So continuing the life of Jesus, we see that he was 30 years old when he was baptized, so that puts him at about 27. And now uh, the Jewish people of the first century were eagerly awaiting the coming of the anointed one, the Messiah, right? We know that because when Jesus showed up, they were all hoping this would be the great king, the Messiah. And so uh, Holy Week would be right around 30 AD. Then on Thursday, there's the Last Supper. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, that's the Sanhedrin. Here's Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin and the trial before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate was 26 to 36 AD. So it leaves a pretty narrow window for Jesus' birth and death. And the crucifixion in 30 AD. Now 40 days later, is the ascension we're following Luke here in the Acts of the Apostles. And then 50 days after the resurrection is Pentecost. And Luke puts this very schematically, 40 days, Jesus goes up, 
having said that he's going to send the Holy Spirit 50 days, uh, the Spirit comes down at Pentecost and starts the Christian church. And that started everything we talked about for the last 1900 years. It's not all the, the holy Christian church, and remember it's people. It's not the institutions. They are very important, but this is about people. And uh, here in his sermon, you can see the tongues of fire here. So we have 34 to 64 of Paul's missionary activities, and his letters were actually written, uh, we believe, between 49 and 62. Paul was present because Paul uh, was originally Saul, was very opposed to these Christian groups. And that's, well, we'll explain later, but that's because he was expecting, like the Jews were, a powerful king to be the Messiah. And Jesus did not fit the bill, especially after he's crucified. And uh, so uh, the first martyr was Stephen, and that was probably around 31 AD, the year after Jesus was crucified. But then Paul started going to Damascus to uh, persecute Christians, and he was struck blind on the road to Damascus, which would have been about 31 or 32 AD, and heard the voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And uh, Paul had to, he was struck blind, he had to rethink all of his ideas about Judaism, which he did. Uh, we have no documents written by Jesus, but we have the seven letters. And Paul was the, at least seven letters, and Paul was the chief theoretician of Christianity. His letters were written to specific churches about specific problems. Uh, here's like a timetable, the crucifixion, the vision, uh, his missionary work, his letters written in the first gospel. So Paul appeared first as a persecutor of Christians, then he did a complete 180 degree reversal to become the most important missionary of the Christian church. And it illuminates both the opposition, the reason for the opposition to Christians from the Jewish people, and the reasons for Christianity's success because Paul became a missionary. When he was struck blind, he was not converted. He reinterpreted Judaism to understand that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Messiah. So I got that. This is Luke's final chapter. I think it's interesting. Sorry. Uh, this is right after the ascension. And the disciples worship Jesus after the ascension and return to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the Jewish temple blessing God. <coughs> Why are they in the Jewish temple? They are good Jews waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah has come. Now, there's also people in the temple who don't think Jesus is the Messiah, and that would become a conflict. <clears throat> but Paul's authoritative interpretation of the death and resurrection of Jesus makes it very important. So what did the early church preach? You know all those. But it says, uh, the message about the cross is foolishness to those perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Uh, it's a religion written in a belief in the death of Jesus for sins and his resurrection from the dead. That's from this book. He was present at the struck blind. Okay, here, what did Paul think about Christianity before the road to Damascus? He thought Jesus, a failure, could not possibly be the Messiah. Someone who died on a tree was cursed, and that Christians should be persecuted. What did he think after the road to Damascus? that Jesus was alive, as he saw him, that Jesus had to be the Messiah, that Jesus' death was intended by God, and that Jesus' death had to be interpreted as a sacrifice for sin. 
And here's, uh, these are the missionary journeys in the kingdom. So I want to do a brief review about monotheism in ancient Israel, which represented in ancient Israel a huge change. Because throughout all history, and this is through the 3,000 years before Jesus, all nations, empires, tribes had been religion, had been religious because religion gives meaning to life. But they were all polytheistic. So here is this timeline of civilization that you have, all the way from 3,000 to zero. But it's only when you hit 1,000 and you have the, is the formation of the nation state of Israel about 1,000, and that is the uh, King David. And from 1,000 up to zero, it's still in the whole world, everybody is polytheistic, including the Greeks and Romans. And the one spot where there is monotheism is Israel. And then, of course, with Christianity, then that changes, and eventually Christianity takes control of the Roman Empire. So the most important date is the nation state of ancient Israel, 1000 BC, which would be King David. There's King David, and that's the timeline. Oh, I was, just as an example of polytheism, you have the Greeks, the Greek gods on Mount Olympus, you know, uh, participating actively in the Trojan War, supposedly. So, for a thousand years from King David to Jesus, Judaism was the only true monotheism in the Mediterranean world. This was, we would say, part of God's plan. And there's been a sequence going from polytheism to monotheism to science to religious freedom in the Enlightenment, which gives us the possibility, whether we like it or not, of secularism. The first possibility of secularism or atheism comes with the Enlightenment era and means 95% of human history was very religious and the possibility of secularism is only the last 5%. We act like the world we're in, which is a very secular world, has always been that way. It's very recent, very new. Mon the invention of monotheism was huge. It's thought by many to be uh, part of the reason that uh, modern science arose. The highly secular world is very recent, and now I'll take questions. The two timeline charts. On this timeline of civilization, polytheism was universal in the 3,000 years before Jesus. People worshipped multiple deities. The exception was ancient Israel from 1000 BC and Judaism with true monotheism. On this timeline of Judaism showing the four time periods, ancient Israel begins at 1000 BC. The prehistoric time period is before 1000 BC. The monarchy time period is 1000 BC to the Babylonian exile. The second temple time period is from Cyrus the Great to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. The rabbinic Judaism time period is from 70 AD to today. Now, now we're going to go to the other, the second half of Old Testament Hebrew scriptures about ancient Israel and Judaism. The Old Testament is very complicated, and my wife was in despair. She said, "Your lecture is too complicated. They'll never finish." <laughs> yeah. Okay. <coughs> Three thousand years of history before Jesus. There's really only one high point. I'm trying to get this nailed down for her benefit. Uh, there was only one high point, the establishment of the nation state of ancient Israel around 1000 BC. The entire rest of the globe is polytheistic. While ancient Israel was, or tried to be, 
for that thousand years uh, from King David to Jesus tried to be monotheistic. So for some unknown reason, God chose this group of people, ancient Israel, to be his chosen people. And I think they did an amazing job. This is my simplification. <laughs> we'll see what Okay, there's the timeline, and again, 1,000 was the foundation of Israel. Two things stand out in ancient Israel. One was the strong moral code, meaning the Ten Commandments, which will become the basis for all the morality of Western civilization. <clears throat> and there's Moses with the Ten Commandments, Sinai Covenant. That moral code was distilled into the highest statement of morality to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And that is still to this day uh, the highest statement of morality. I'm not aware that anybody even thinks they can better it, but that was uh, from Judaism, first century Judaism, and in fact Jesus and the expert of the law debated this, and Jesus said, how do you read the scriptures? He said that, and Jesus said, that's right. Now there is more to Christianity than just morality, but the Christian morality, love your neighbor and yourself, comes out of the experience of a thousand years of Judaism working that out. The biblical values start and end with love your neighbor as yourself. And as Jesus makes clear in this passage, the values were the same for first century Jewish people as for Christians. So they're called Judeo-Christian values. The other thing that stands out in the history of Israel is the prophecy of a, that God would send an anointed one, a Messiah, to save his chosen people. And of course the people who are still Jewish today are still today waiting for that person. Every Passover Seder has a cup for Elijah, who is the forerunner of the Messiah. And of course Christians understand that the Messiah has already come and his name is Jesus. That's the difference between Judaism and Christianity. To understand the Old Testament, we must understand four separate and distinct time periods. Uh, and each of them has certain books of the Old Testament associated with it. And here they are, the four periods of Judaism. The prehistoric Judaism that's created, it's before King David, before 1000. Then monarchy Judaism, that's King David. 1,000 to 532, which is uh, Cyrus the Great. And we're going to go into that, believe me. And then, after Cyrus rescues the Jewish people from the Babylonian exile and brings, allows them to come back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, we have the second temple Judaism from 532 B.C. to 70 A.D. 70 AD is when the uh, Jews in Judea revolt against the Romans, which was not a smart idea, because <laughs> the Romans came in and just smashed them and, and destroyed the temple. And ever since 70 AD, the Jewish religion, which was all focused on the temple, has not had a temple. And we're going to talk about that. After 7 AD, 70 AD, we have something called Rabbinic Judaism. So if you go into a local synagogue, that's what you will be dealing with. And I'm going to talk about what the difference is in just a second. OK. <clears throat> now I also handed out a timeline of Judaism, right? And here are the three periods. I left off the one, the, uh, the prehistoric. But the monarchy period and the first temple, and there's the Babylonian exile in red. The second temple period, and that's 532 years before Jesus and 70 after his birth. 
So it's like a 600 year period, and then from 70 on, it's this rabbinic Judaism. I'm not going to cover rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism today, because it's not in the Bible or the Old Testament. But I want to clear up one confusion. Many people assume, I assume, that if you went into a local synagogue, you would be dealing with the same Judaism that Jesus did. That's not correct. Because Judaism prior to 70 AD, when it had the temple, was a sacrificial religion, meaning animal sacrifices, like lambs or goats or turtle doves. All sacrifices had to be made in one place, which was the temple of Jerusalem. So the temple was the center of Second Temple Judaism in the time of Jesus and for 500 years before. But in 70 AD, after the rebellion and the temple was destroyed, the, Rome, the Judaism was forced to make a huge change because there were no more animal sacrifices. And that change without animal sacrifices is called rabbinic Judaism. Now remember, animal sacrifices throughout the entire Middle Eastern world were absolutely standard. The Assyrian religion, the Babylonian religion, the Hittite religion, the Egyptian religion, they were all animal sacrifices. Judaism was not in any way an exception, but since 70 AD, they did not have they did not have a place to sacrifice. What matters to Christians about this is Yom Kippur. Because in Judaism, most sacrifices were in the main part of the temple, called the court of the Jewish people. But once a year, there was an inner room in the temple at, at uh, Jerusalem called the Holy of Holies. Nobody was allowed to go in there the whole year. Only once a year, and that's because in that, I'll show you in a second, uh, that held the Ark of the Covenant, a box containing the Ten Commandments. And that was so holy, that was viewed as the place that God dwelt in the temple, the Holy of Holies. Once a year, the priest would go in there and offer a sacrifice for the sins of all people. And Yom Kippur is called the Day of Atonement, and that was a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people <coughs> for the last year. Oops, I hit that. Now here's the second temple, huge, huge building. And within the Jewish, the Jerusalem temple, the innermost room was the Holy of Holies. And on the, in the ark, there's the top of the ark is called the mercy seat. That's where the high priest once a year sprinkled blood for the sins of the people. Here is what the ark looked like. And you can see here's the ark that's a box that can be carried on people's shoulders. And here. But that top of the ark is called the mercy seat. Uh, in Greek it's called hilasterion. And that's where, uh, in Second Temple Judaism, the high priest entered the Holy Holies, Holy of Holies, only one day each year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, sprinkled sacrificial blood on the mercy seat for the sins of the people for the previous year. In Christianity, the Apostle Paul interpreted the death of Jesus on the cross in exactly the same way as a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of all people all the time, not once a year. Instead of an annual sacrifice once a year like Judaism, Paul understood Christ's death on the cross as performed only one time for the sins of all people. So this is a very important connection between Judaism and Christianity. Paul, and first, here's just some examples. I handed up on to you, as of the first importance, 
what I in turn had received from the disciples, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. I'm just giving this up. In Romans, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Here in Romans, God sent his own son to, in the likeness of sinful flesh as a human to be a sin offering. And Mark and Matthew have similar statements. Luke is sometimes a bit different. So now we can go back to the four time periods of Judaism and the books of the Old Testament related to each one. The oldest one was this prehistoric Judaism before 1000 BC. I'm going to go into that a little later. But the nation state of ancient Israel was in a tough neighborhood back then. Actually, it still is in a tough neighborhood. But in the cradle of civilization, the Fertile Crescent, surrounded by huge and powerful empires that rose and fell. It was an ugly place to be a nation because you had all these strong powers around you always trying to conquer you and sometimes succeeding. Here is, this is the Mediterranean, there is Israel, and you will see that down, that's Israel, there's Egypt to the south, there's Assyria to the northeast, there's Babylonia, and then later on there's going to be Persia under Cyrus the Great, uh, Greece under Alexander the Great, and then finally Rome. Uh, all of these conquer Israel at one time or another. This is the neighborhood they're in. Uh, the prehistoric Judaism, that's the exodus from Egypt, the conquest of Canaan, the establishment of Israel. And if you're interested, I, I did a whole pair of lectures, two hours of lecture on the Exodus and everything about archaeology. But I can't, without getting my wife upset. <laughs> okay, prehistoric Judaism is seven books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Those are the first seven books, and they're about that prehistoric. Now we have monarchy Judaism from 1000 from to 532, from King David to Cyrus the Great. And here is the sad story of Israel's monarchy. There is a united monarchy, that's King Saul, King David, and King Solomon from 1000 BC to 930 about 930. That's about 70 years. And then, at that point, the kingdom splits. And from that time on, there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom has 19 kings and finally collapsed in 722 to the, Assyri the Neo Assyrian Empire. And the southern kingdom had 20 kings and collapsed in 586 to the Neo-Babylonian Empire. In fact, here is a map of ancient Israel, and you can see all of this is Israel. The blue is the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and the yellowish so is sort of the kingdom of Judah. That's the split. And here is very important. Jerusalem, that was the capital of the whole thing, is now situated in the southern kingdom and not the northern kingdom, which becomes very important. Okay, there's the map. So this is the sad story because it's going to be a story of Israel and Judah going downhill until they finally wind up in the Babylonian captivity and Babylonian exile. It's almost uh, I won't say a straight line, but it's a sad story. So, the books for the monarchy in First Temple period, one at First and Second Samuel is about the united mon monarchy of King Saul, David, and Solomon. First and Second Kings is about all the rest of the kings of Israel. First and Second Chronicles is covering basically the same story. So here is another way to look at it. 
between 1000 and 532, between King David and Cyrus the Great. You had the unified monarchy, David and Solomon, from 1000 to 930. The northern kingdom, until the Neo-Assyrian conquest, from 930 to 722. The southern kingdom, uh, from 930 to 586, when the Babylonians, uh, caught the Neo-Babylonians, and then the Babylonian exile is this 586, five, that's about 48 years of exile. I'm sure you've all got that and memorized it. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, all of this, you can Google it, it's, it's all, <coughs> and I can give you copies of the slides. You know. Now, the historian who wrote uh, especially first and second kings, rated every king of the northern and southern kingdom as either good or bad. The Deuteronom Deuteronomic historian is very judgmental. Okay? And when he's talking about good or bad, he doesn't mean, you know, did they grow the kingdom or did they set up a new program? He means, did they worship right? It's theology. Did they sacrifice at the right place and in the right way? And did they allow these other gods, Baal or Astarte or various other gods, to uh, uh, be worshipped? Because the historian wants people totally monotheistic. Now, all 19 kings of the northern kingdom are rated as bad. Why are they all bad? because the city of Jerusalem, which is the only place the Deuteronomic historian thinks you should have sacrifices, is in a different country. The Jerusalem is in the southern kingdom. So the kings of the northern kingdom are not going to send their people to sacrifice in a different nation. So they're all bad. The northern kings are all bad. Of the 20 kings of the southern kingdom, uh, eight are rated good and 12 are rated bad. And we can talk about that. Oops, what am I doing here? Okay, here. And uh, I actually have a nice chart that shows them with green and red lines. You know, the green are the good ones and the red. And you can sort of see the, the picture. Okay. There's a large amount of corroboration of this information with outside history. You know, there were records, they tell it, uh, the first and second kings tells exactly how long each king ruled. You know, five years, 20 years, three months sometimes. But there, and, and it all lines up with history. References to Egyptian pharaohs and Assyrian monarchs and Babylonian monarchs. They are talking about the kings in Israel at the right time and vice versa. So the quality of historical accuracy of the monarchy history is surprisingly high and because uh, it matches up. Now the prophets, and the most interesting thing to me is the prophets are almost entirely about the monarchy. I hadn't realized that till I had to present it, but almost everything they're talking about. Here are the prophets. Three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Joel, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. But almost everything they're talking about is the monarchy. And you know what they're talking about? They're talking about why is the monarchy going downhill? Okay? That's a very real problem in Israel. And why are the prophets important? Because they interpreted Israel's history. But more specifically, they interpreted the way God intervened in Israel's history. Because to the prophets, everything that happened in Israel and Judah came from upstairs. Okay? God is running the show. So if something bad happens, it means God is punishing that group of people. The prophets focused on the Sinai Covenant, the Ten Commandments, 
condemning disobedience to them, which it found widespread in the kings, the need for repentance, the hope for forgiveness, and then the anointed one, the Messiah, the promise of the Messiah. These are the main messages of the prophets. <clears throat> and the prophets' interpretation, listen to this, when the Neo-Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom, that was Yahweh's punishment for the sins of the northern kingdom. When the Neo-Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom, that was Yahweh's punishment for its sins. And then when Cyrus came in and conquered the Babylonians and released the Israelites, the Jewish people, from the Babylonian exile, to the prophets, that is God sending Cyrus. I can imagine Cyrus might be a little bit surprised to find out that God was giving him orders, but this is very much the interpretation. Here's Isaiah, he says, this is Isaiah, you can read it, chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. Cyrus is part of God's plan. This is a, a vision of God's total control of the world that is magnificent. Two dates are scientifically established. This is at the back at the beginning, 1208 and 1000. Uh, 1000 is the establishment of the nation state of ancient Israel. 1208 was the first mention of Israel, the word Israel, outside the Bible by an Egyptian pharaoh, but we're not going to be able to. Okay. That date of 1000 BC was established and corroborated by the invasion of this pharaoh, Shoshank of Egypt in 925, because we know the pharaoh and we know when he invaded. And the Bible says he invaded five years after the death of King Solomon, which means King Solomon died in 930. And if you then, since King David and King Solomon are both credited with reigns of 40 years, that moves the start of King David back to about 1010. In other words, if Solomon died in, in 930, 240s put you back there. So that approximate date, 1,000 is not exact, but it's approximate, and it's confirmed by other evidence. This was the pharaoh Shoshank. That's the date he rules, and he invaded it in 925. And there's a bunch, three references to that five years after the... Okay, there's a, that's some new evidence. Okay, now we've done... Uh, we've talked a little bit about prehistoric, we've talked about the monarchy, and now we're going to look at the other simple Second Temple Judaism from 530, uh, 530, 532 to 7. Okay. Turning now, we're going to look at it, and here is Second Temple Judaism from that Cyrus, and we're going to see that in a second. In Second Temple Judaism, we have a book called Daniel that's an apocalyptic book. We have the wisdom literature such as Proverbs, and we have the Messiah in Second Temple Judaism thought, and the resurrection of the dead. There are almost no history books about the Second Temple era, which is very interesting in itself. And, uh, the Messiah in Second Temple Judaism, particularly in the first century, the time of Jesus and Paul, was a very major issue. The expectation, you know, people would suddenly hear about a Messiah and pretty soon they were all going out ready to fight the Romans. And the resurrection of the dead was really not part of Judaism in the monarchy. The first, the first mention of it is actually in the book of Daniel, and that's during the Second Temple period. The Babylonian captivity was a big shock. This about 50 years, horrifying experience. 
because the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians, and uh, but the prophets interpreted uh, the captivity as again a punishment, but that God would redeem them, which He did by Cyrus. Cyrus the Great returned the Jewish people from Babylonian captivity and exile and let them or help them reestablish the temple because he was a very benevolent dictator. He was a, definitely a dictator. And you can see Cyrus here. Cyrus in that 600 year period of Second Temple Judaism. <coughs> Ezra and Nehemiah returned and uh, rebuilt the temple. And that's the same thing. And with the return of the Jewish exiles to Jerusalem, the Bible's history lesson ended. There are no other history books. Uh, the Jerusalem temple was rebuilt, and the Second Temple era began. And it will last 70 years, until 70 AD, past the time of Jesus and Paul. So the Judaism that Jesus knew was Second Temple Judaism, the Judaism that Paul knew was Second Temple Judaism. There's Jesus and Paul. Uh, the major events during this period, there were Cyrus conquers Babylon for the Persians, then Alexander and the Greeks conquer the whole area in 332, and then this book of Daniel we can date to right about 165, which also starts the Maccabean Rebellion, and then that would be uh, another story. Alexander brought the Greek language and Greek culture. The important thing was this translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek called the Septuagint, because Greek became the language of the whole uh, Middle East, and especially the diaspora Jews. There's Alex. And the book of Daniel is what's called the Apocalypse. The other one like it is in the New Testament called the book of Revelation. Written a time of extreme persecution. Uh, persecution led to the Maccabean Rebellion. And the book of Daniel had a huge impact on Judaism, much larger than we might think because most people sort of treat it dismissively today. Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. My sisters and I always called it Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, Judas Maccabeus uh, started a rebellion and succeeded in kicking out the Greeks. The impact of Daniel is one of many apocalyptic books, but it's the only one in the official canon of the Old Testament. It increased expectations of a Messiah, anointed one, and it's the only direct mention of the resurrection of the dead in the Old Testament. Apocalyptic Judaism. Apocalypse are about the end times and the feeling that they're coming soon. The world will end soon. And in the first century, there were two people deeply influenced by apocalyptic Judaism. The whole, all of Judaism was influenced. But Jesus and Paul were both people who saw the end times coming very soon. In fact, Paul told people, don't marry because the end will be here soon. But the result is that the last 12 books of the Bible are the 12 prophets, and the Bible goes from the 12 uh, <clears throat> minor prophets directly into Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And, and the, the fact we don't have that much information about Second Temple of Judaism means when we encounter groups like the Pharisees and Sadducees or Essenes, we don't really know a lot about them unless we try to study them. So here's the timeline. OK, I'm going to finish because I skipped over the book of Revelation, and probably a good thing. But the Revelation, book of Revelation in the New Testament is the one apocalyptic book in the New Testament, and the book of Daniel is the one in the Old. 
And it may be the most fascinating and controversial book in the Bible, but uh, it's a book about the end times, the end of the world coming soon, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Some people think it shouldn't be in the Bible, but it's type called apocalyptic, and the other book that's considered the same is Daniel, and there's other ones, but not in the... Uh, an apocalyptic book is a first-person narrative of a visionary experience, and it's usually a heavenly journey or a futuristic vision. And they're often weird or bizarre. And believe me, uh, the book of <coughs> Revelation is weird and bizarre. And so, to some extent, is the book of Daniel. Uh, John writes a letter to seven churches. And then he was also granted access to the throne room of heaven. Uh, he sees a scroll sealed with seven seals, but no one has the authority to break the seals and discover the future until a lamb appears, which represents Jesus Christ. And then as each seal is broken, it unleashes a calamity on earth. And there are seven trumpets, more calamities, seven bowls of wrath, more calamities, the situation is very dire. Those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And other characters appear, the devil, the antichrist, the great whore of Babylon. Ever since the Babylonian exile, following the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 586, Babylon represented evil to the uh, uh, Jews and Christians. And in this case, it clearly refers to the Roman Empire. There were persecutions going on. In apocalyptic books, the good side always wins. Evil is defeated after much struggle. The sovereignty of God prevails. These books offer hope. They often appear at times of great persecution, such as Daniel and Revelation. Bart Ehrman, that Bible scholar who I mentioned is an atheist, but he's a very fine scholar, has lectured about this book, and he tells of moving in 1988 from Rutgers University in New Jersey to the University of North Carolina. At his first week, he received a call from a newspaper reporter asking whether it's true that Jesus was, was coming back to Earth in September. <laughs> and a NASA engineer named Edgar Wisenet had published a book called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. And it had sold 2 million copies. And it made the prediction for September 88, 1988, 40 years after the founding of Israel in 1948. Well, that's the book, 88 Reasons. So. There have been many similar books interpreting the book of Revelation, including The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, and the Left Behind series, there's those books. What can be stated as Christian doctrine is that Christians are always awaiting the second coming of Jesus. It may happen at any time. Beyond that, I would suggest avoiding these books and going to the Bible to find out what Jesus says and the letters of Paul. And, and what Jesus says is that nobody knows when, it's, when the end is coming, except, yeah. That's correct. Okay, I'm going to summarize, uh, summarize and then uh, have questions. According to the Bible, the Lord God Almighty, the triune God, chose to reveal himself in three acts, the Old Testament, Jesus, and then in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. That's what Christians believe. Many secular intellectuals hold a different view that everything from the creation on, the Big Bang, was accidental and not the work of any higher or transcendent higher power. And the question is, how do we interpret the evidence? You can see how I interpret the evidence, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.